Bernard, it's uh, really with great honor that we ask you to come up and provide a, a, a keynote for us, and, and thank you for being here with us for the day. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, and good morning to all of you, and really nice to see you again after the really memorable dinner yesterday. I really appreciate it. Uh, your moderation, all the, I mean, it's fascinating to see what, how much initiative there is here and uh, all the kind of things that are happening. Um, I, I'm, I would like to thank you, Michael, for inviting me to come here. I'm, I'm really grateful. I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity for me. And um, as you say, uh, I think what's, what's really important is partnership and, and cooperation. And, um, and um, you know, Michael is so well connected and networked and, and knowledgeable. And actually, I'm discovering as much here as in Europe. When, when I want to know what's going on in innovation and accelerators and, and blue business and blue tech in Europe, I often have the instinct of just calling you actually and asking you what's happening because you know it in, you have been to, to Portugal, to Norway, all around, perhaps more than me actually. So, you know, it's, it's, a, really good, uh, it's a really good way of actually learning from each other. And the, the kind of things that you're doing are, are things that we aspire to do too. We have a slightly different approach in Europe. Uh, it's a bit more driven by, by government, um, but we, we, try to, we try to sort of mobilize this kind of innovative uh, fabric of the blue economy. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really grateful that you, that you invited me to speak here today. And you invited me to speak about the sustainable development goals, right? And um, uh, I, Rather than going into the details of SDG 1 to 17, I thought I'd speak about the sustainability as such and, and the, the blue economy. We call it blue economy. I think you call it ocean economy. I heard a lot of blue economy yesterday, too. Um, and, um, and I think the message I'd like to give is that for us, at least, it's the same thing. Uh, sustainable oceans, you know, keeping the oceans healthy and having a a sustainable economy, it's, it converges. Uh, that, that's, my, that's my message, and that's what I try to develop. But maybe to start with a, with a few facts, um, I'll just give you a, a few numbers, actually, just to, this is 10 million tons. That is the amount of plastic that we put into the oceans every year, right? Um, so almost 90% of that is single-use plastic. So it's the paper, uh, the, the, the plastic cups, the, the plates, the straws, the uh, the cotton bats, you know, th these kind of things that uh, you can you can see it everywhere. It's it's something that um, that creates harm to the environment, and it creates harm probably to to us humans too, because these kind of things they 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 disintegrate into microplastics, they sink down to the bottom of the sea, and they they risk entering back into the food chain. Um, Twenty billion euro, so that's probably around I don't know twenty twenty four billion dollars, something like that. Um, it's larger than the, the, the gross national product of some of our European Union countries, actually. It's the amount of money that's being, that's being made in, in illegal fishing globally. Um, so that is uh, the third largest illegal economic activity anywhere after drug trade and, 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 and something else. And, and it, of course, illegal fishing goes very often together with other bad things like, like organized crime, like, like slavery, th things like that. 70% is the percentage of the, the polar summer ice that has disappeared since the 1980s. So as we speak, the Arctic is, is melting. It is melting. Uh, the poles, both poles are actually warming faster than, than the, uh, the atmosphere and, and surface temperatures across, across the planet. Um, and the risk you face, of course, when that happens is that it puts in, it triggers an unstoppable chain of events because if the permafrost is melting in the Arctic uh, melting, it will release methane and methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So we risk getting into a point and maybe we'll reach it soon where we, we are in a runaway, in a runaway logic, right? So that's a bit the, the state of the oceans, just in, in three figures. Uh, not all is lost, right? So there's not all is doom and gloom. I could have shown you a, a few other figures. 99% is the amount of fish, of landings of fish that in the northern part of European seas 
the, the Atlantic, the North Sea, Baltic Sea, we are now fishing sustainably. So we have a sustainability target in our fisheries management. We have managed to get it there. So that's the, the biomass of, of European fish stocks in the, in the Atlantic is 30% higher than, 10, than 15 years ago. Um, it's not like the same areas. In the Mediterranean, we are doing very badly, uh, but there we're doing well. So there, it's, progress is possible, right? Um, 160,000 jobs created in the offshore wind industry in Europe in 10 years. This is as many uh, people as work in fisheries in Europe. And you know, the curve is, is rising. Um, one trillion euro, so equivalent dollars, is the turnover that we think the European blue economy can have in 2030. So this is a, a rate of growth that outpaces the general economy. Um, so that's, uh, that's a bit the, uh, the upside. Um, I'd like to sort of say a few words about how we protect the oceans and then go back to the economy. Um, how do we protect the oceans? We do it through things like environmental policies, of course. We have um, uh, a, a target uh, which we are reaching for marine protected areas, right? Um, we are fighting the plastic pollution. Uh, and last year, the European Union put in place European legislation, a European law, that will phase out uh, single-use plastic items because most of these things are either fishing nets, fishing gear, or, or single-use plastic items. So if, next time you travel to Europe, you will see fewer uh, straws. Uh, if you take, take a cocktail, fewer uh, plastic uh, razors, whatever. These, these kind of things have to go. And this is unique in the world. I mean, many countries are doing something nobody does as ambitiously as we do. So everybody's watching if, if it's going to work. Um, no, that's not. Uh, um, we um, uh, are fighting legal fishing, so the, the famous IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. So we're doing that very actively. Um, that's the, the 20 billion uh, euro business. Um, we have uh, a trade regime, so we're actually speaking to countries globally. Um, we are discussing with them how, they can, how we can help them improve their fisheries management to be sustainable. If it doesn't work, we can close our market. So if people here in, in this country believe trade sanctions work, I can tell you they do work. They do work. If we close a consumer market of 450 million consumers, then change is happening. And we have quite a number of success stories there. Um, and we are working with partners worldwide. We're working with, uh, with many developing countries. We have a development uh, cooperation policy, of course. We're working with China. We have an ocean partnership with China and we're in dialogue with them on fisheries and on the, on the blue economy. So, but the reality is the economy, right? And so this is, um, this is, uh, this is my main message. Uh, you know, let's look at the blue economy and see how we can turn it sustainable. Uh, what is it? It's, uh, it's basically something that is much more than just a coastal economy. So our value chains, they go deep into the, into the continent. So the, the, the turbines for the most advanced, advanced wind, wind um, uh, power stations are, are built in Austria, right? It's not a coastal country, but it's, it's an engineering uh, market. Um, it is bigger than the European aviation and defense industries taken together. Globally, if you take the ocean economy, it would be a member of the G7. It would be the seventh largest um, national economy if you equate it to a national economy. It has a huge potential for reaching, um, for, for innovation, for, 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 for new technology. And you can read all that and more in our annual Blue Economy report. So we are publishing this year for the third time uh, a, an economic report. And we have tried to build it on an increasingly long time series of data now. So we are able to look back at least 10 years. We can see trends. And, and that's one of the trends. That's one of the trends. If you look at the GBA generated by what is the traditional industries, right? In, in the, so shipbuilding, oil and gas, um, uh, transport, um, ports. The black dotted line is, the, um, is the, just the general, the mean of the general economy in Europe. You can see they're underperforming. They have been underperforming over a decade. So that's, that's clearly the trend. So the traditional industries are not doing super well. The one that is doing very well is what we call the bioeconomy, which is fisheries and 
fish farming and aquaculture, and there is a, a reason for that. I believe, we believe, and the economic reason is actually linked to sustainability. So this chart shows you, so the, the curve that's going down is, is the one that is the degree of overfishing. So we are getting into, again in the, in the Atlantic, we're getting into the green zone. So in terms of fishing pressure, we get into a, a zone where we are you know, sustainable. Um, the, 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 the dark blue chart is the, is the GBA per, per vessel. And you can see the, at one point the lines cross and, and the economic performance goes up. With, with increasing sustainability, you do better. And you can say, see the same thing if you pitch that line against profits. So the European Union fishing fleet has a, in the mean, a net profit rate of 17% this year or last year. So where's the growth? Um, if, if you go up the coast here and, and to Hawthorne and you, you, you visit Tesla Motors, uh, you ask yourself why they have a, a, a stock market capitalization of, of more than Daimler and more than half of Volkswagen. And every now and then they have even a, a profit, a quarterly profit, uh, whereas Volkswagen is making, you know, five or four or five billion dollars profit every year. Um, it's the future. It's the expectation for the future that, that, makes, them, that makes them strong. And, and this, is, this is where we see the real potential. It's, it's things like renewables, huge growth market. It's medicines, huge, huge growth market. It is seafood, enormously dynamic growth market globally, simply for demographic uh, reasons. So these are, these are three trends. Uh, and, um, um, you know, the, the next thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is, is uh, folks, we have to talk about the climate, right? I love the New Yorker because they, 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 they make the point sometimes. Huh? This, by the way, is not 21st century. Yeah? This is possibly 2040 or 2050. So the, the, the background, right, sort of the, the crumbling civilization. Um, so we need to talk about that. We need to, we need to link that. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the, the ins and outs of the, the climate crisis here. Um, uh, you, you can ask your, your children. They will probably <laughs> have asked you about that already, I guess. Um, the youngsters yesterday who were here, I think they are quite acutely aware. They are at least in Europe. They, they are on the streets uh, because they tell us, you know, what are you doing? And I think it's a very, it's a very pertinent question that, that we have to answer. Uh, and I'm not sure we can answer it. Um, if you don't believe me, by the way, believe the, uh, maybe you believe the Department of Defense. Uh, one thing the military is good at is, is planning, is scenario building, it's, it's foresight. Um, this is a good study that shows how, how many of their installations they fear are at risk from extreme weather events, from, from flooding, from drought, from, from these kind of things. So the military is worried about it, actually. Now, my point here is, is about the oceans, and it's about you know, um, the implications that, that the climate catastrophe will have on the oceans in terms of uh, sea level rise. So we look at up to a meter by 2021. Um, so by 2100, so 2100, um, we look at a, a, an increase, a strong and exponential increase in extreme weather events. So things that happened a decade, once a decade in the past may happen once a year uh, or once a month even in the future, depending on how far you look forward. We look at movement of fish stocks. That means that the, the the, the, the food supply for, for parts of the planet will start disappearing, like especially around the tropics, with the social and economic implications and with the migration implications. These people are going to come, right? They, 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 that's, it's, it's very human. Um, we, we, we look at um, acidification. We look at perhaps the risk to, um, to coastal cities, Southeast Asia, even in Europe. You know, go to Copenhagen, where I'm going after this. Uh, it's built at sea level, right? So. Imagine a, a rise of 30 centimeters, not, not good. So the, the, what will happen is that the European Union next month on the 11th of December will put out a plan uh, that we have, I think we have sort of it's stolen the name from something that has been invented here in this, in this great country, a Green Deal, a European Green Deal. And the, the ambition of the plan will be, and that this is a huge ambition, is to, to, to try to decarbonize our society by 2050, right? So to, to remove carbon 
from, from, from our economy by, tw by 2050. Um, and, and as you can imagine, this is really like sort of turning the tanker around. No? This, is, this is a big, a big turnaround. And um, so to become basically what, what we call in the jargon cl climate neutral. So that means no more fossil fuels, uh, no more carbon emissions. Can it be done? Can it be done? If it can be done, it, it, it has to involve, and that's my, my point here, it has to be involve the blue economy, it has to involve the oceans. Um, so we have been, in, in, in the European Commission, we have been looking at, at eight scenarios. There's a, a big, a big paper from last November. Um, so our scientists have, have been looking at these eight scenarios, various assumptions, uh, to see what could be the pathways to, to zero emissions. And um, what they have in common, for instance, is that you have to ramp up electricity production a lot. Why? Because you have to take the, the fossil fuels out of many sectors of the economy where they are very important, like energy intensive industry, steel, um, uh, chemicals, transport, uh, house heating, right? And for that, if you want to provide the energy, you need more renewables. So in some scenarios, actually, they think you have to double the production of electricity and it would have to be, of course, renewable electricity. So you have to get out of coal, out of oil and gas and so on. How to do that? Well, you know, you need the space. Uh, you need the space. And, um, and there are limits on land. Europe is a small continent. Uh, and, and so we think that uh, to do that, you need to move 25% of our electricity supply offshore. Right? So you see a little bit in a, in a stylized way the, the, the curve of what would be needed. Um, we're here. We might get increased by a factor of four in 2030. That's pretty much already in the investment decisions that have been taken by the industry in Europe today. Um, more than 90% of all offshore renewables are in, in European waters globally at the moment. So we, we will get to that point in 2030 probably. And we'll have to think very hard and work very hard to, to think how we use the sea space we have to, to get to this point in, in 2050. The other, the other big thing is, is, uh, is food. And uh, agriculture produces globally, I think, about 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions, and the whole food system probably around 25%. So it's pretty, pretty substantial. Um, this just shows the, the geographical footprint and the, the carbon footprint of different sources of food. And you can see that's a, a logarithmic, scale, logarithmic scale. So if you, dare I say it, if you look at beef, you know, you're in a completely different league. So we have to think of ways of how we can produce protein from, from, um, from other sources. And, and you know, probably some of the, the lowest footprints are in, in, in seafood. And that is, of course, fish. But it can also be products that are further down the food chain, like, like algae and, and, and shellfish and, and so on. In Asia, this is happening. Eh? This is happening in Asia, at big scale. It's not happening in Europe. I don't think it's happening in the, in the United States, but it's happening in China and in Asia. So it's possible. It will go along with a huge change in, in demand. OK, so the, the blue buy economy. So we, we are really keen to, 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 to support our blue buy economy. And I think you, you are doing the same. And, and some of you are working in, 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 in companies that are really, really innovative there. And, um, so there, we know about 200,000 marine species, uh, but there are probably 10 times as many in, in, in the oceans. Um, we believe, and we have quite a number of companies that are really good at, at doing that already and have a lot of potential, that um, bio, marine biotechnology can be a great supplier of, of pharmaceutical products. Um, it can produce algae-based um, uh, feed can, can replace animal-based feed in, in poultry, in, in, in animal, in, in fish production, big scale. And it has actually a higher omega-3 content than, than, most, than most fish oil produced from, from, from caught fish. Um, we have uh, launched in Europe a so-called Blue Bioeconomy Forum. So we basically put together industry, co small companies, startup companies, and the public sector, and a few scientists. So I think you would call that a triple helix approach. And we asked them basically, what are the, the problems you are facing scaling up? Very practically, you know, the licenses you need, uh, the, 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 the permissions for, for new food or new feed products and so on. Make a list and work through it and see how we can help the industry basically get, get through that. 
We'll launch that roadmap um, on the 3rd of December at an event in Paris. So if, if you're interested, please contact me. I'm happy to give you the details. Algae have, a, as you know very well, I don't need to say that here, really, have a huge role to play in terms of making aquaculture, for instance, less dependent on wild fish catches, on many other things you, you can see here. Um, right, so these are sort of the big, the big, the big you know, building construction sites, as it were. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish by saying just a few things we are doing, and I'll, I'll promise with that I'll stop throwing slides at you. And, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's just a, a selection of the kind of policies and projects we are running to try to advance the blue economy in Europe. Uh, marine data. So this is a network of 100 or more than 100 uh, marine institutes, research institutes, uh, and the purpose is to, um, to, to provide a single entry point for data so that you don't have to go to 20 different uh, national institutes or regional institutes. You, you can actually have a simple, single web, web interface. It's called Imodnet. It does help uh, research, but it does help also business development. So if you want to develop, I don't know, a, a prediction service for um, weather events or for algae blooms or something like that, you can use these data and you can use them for, for free. Um, we organize hackathons. So we just put out these data and we give them to you know, young developers to, to, to basically develop products uh, on that basis. We did two of those and sort of that's really, that's really interesting. Um, maritime spatial planning. Um, if we want to get to where I said we probably will have to get, I don't know whether we will, but we have to get, which is to scale up things like offshore renewables, um, you know, fixed or floating or whatever, and, and you know, using the sea for food production and feed production and, and other things. Then we'll be looking at a completely different scale of the use of the sea, and we still have to reconcile it with protecting the maritime environment and not making sure we, you know, we, we harm marine ecosystems more than, 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 than we can absolutely avoid. And the many other uses, like transport and, and uh, extraction and, and, and many other fisheries, of course, many other things. So without having really a really proper integrated science-based planning, you can't do that. And so we have in Europe, a, we have actually European legislation that obliges public authorities in our 28 countries to have, well, 22 uh, coastal countries to have a, have national um, maritime spatial plans and to work together so that these things become integrated. And we're doing that. We throw a lot of money at it. So we actually fund cooperation projects. We bring it together in a place like this, sit together, work these things out together. And we, we, we try to help work with the, uh, the International Oceanographic Commission of the, of the UNESCO to lead globally. So there's a, we have a global project bringing in countries from all over the world to, to do that. Um, and that works very well. And that's a, real, a really good story in terms of you know, making a, a big leap forward in the, in the maritime space. Um, investing in people. So we have started, um, so interestingly, in, there's still a lot of redundancy and unemployment in, in European economy, but when you speak to some of the maritime operators, they, they tell us we can't find the right, the right people to, to recruit, right? we can't find the right qualifications. So we have started doing, doing something about it. Uh, one of them is a, a so-called Blue Careers program that we are funding from our European Maritime Fund. And it's basically projects that try to link um, academia and uh, vocational education and training and, and you know parts of the industry, and you have that all over Europe. And Michael knows that better than me because he has been <laughs> he has been in many of these places. Liverpool is a good example, right? So you have the John Moores University, and they work with a whole fabric of their maritime economy in in, in that you know great port city. Uh, and then there's a European Skills Alliance that I will not go into that, but it's it's a kind of strategic approach to try to identify where are the sector needs for skills, and then how can we how can we help. Um, then I, I move on to, to ocean literacy and sort of the idea behind that is um, to try to sort of mainstream the message, right? Sort of to, to get the message across about the oceans. Um, even in my daily work, when I try to 
you know, when we are discussing our European Green Deal, it's a really uphill battle to convince decision makers and my peers in the Commission to actually understand how important the oceans are and how important the maritime economy and the ocean environment is. It's real, and it is the same in society. I mean, of course it is if you go to, here in San Diego is not a problem. Last week I was in, I was in Britannia and I spoke to the fishermen about Brexit and, and nobody there has any doubt about that. But go to, you know, go to any other big city and you know, people will look at you and I, ah, yes. So to, to get that message across and, and the easiest way to get it across is to engage with young people and uh, they're on the street anyway, at least in where I come from. So we are, we are launching a project actually right now, uh, but to be rolled out in, in 2020 about um, creating you know, a network of, of blue schools and a platform for, for young people and these, these kind of things. This is sponsored by our European Parliament, so they are, parliamentarians are very keen on that. They have given us a lot of money to do that, so we are going to spend that money and, and get, that, get that going. Then, of course, R&D, and, and Michael knows that very well because you have very good, good contacts and a very good partnership with, uh, with my friends and brothers and sisters from our commission um, research and development department. And there's a great, great, great um, bilateral, trilateral cooperation going on between Europe and the United States and Canada and the North Atlantic and now extended to, uh, uh, to Brazil and to South Africa, I think. Uh, so. Europe has traditionally had very well-funded research support programs. The new thing as of 2021 will be that we'll have so-called missions, right? And that sounds cryptical, but it is actually a very concrete idea. The idea is to, to not only support universities and researchers, but to actually start from society and from industry and to formulate concrete objectives. I'll give you an example, plastic-free oceans by 2035. How can we get there? And, and so to, to engage with, with really with citizens and society, what, what do they expect? And then mobilize the, mobilize the, the, the R&D to, to get there. So the inspiration is the famous moonshot, um, you know, getting a man on the moon by, um, so we'll try to do that. And I think it's, it, has a lot of, it has a lot of potential. So the oceans, uh, healthy oceans are, are one of the five missions that we have selected. I'm very happy about that because this, a lot of money is going to go into that and a lot of attention and political uh, focus is going to go into that. Um, all right, and then to end, I'd, I'd like to speak about um, probably the most important thing, um, and that is investment. And to, to get where I said we would like to get to, which is, which is uh, you know, becoming climate neutral and, and to, to use the blue economy to to become a sustainable blue economy, um, we need to do two things. We need to invest in infrastructure and in the fabric of the economy, and we need to invest in innovation. <laughs> and so these are two things we try to do. And the first one is, this is the European Investment Bank. It's a, a public development bank. It's the largest multilateral um, uh, public development bank in the world. It's not as big as the Bank of China, but it's, uh, or the China Development Bank, but it's, it's, it's pretty big too. Um, it has been extremely instrumental in getting all the uh, wind renewables uh, going in Europe. Today, when you build a wind farm in the North Sea, you don't get subsidies anymore. This was subsidized 30 years ago. Today, they, you do that at, at commercial some of them do it at commercial rates. Um, the European Investment Bank has, um, has spent a lot of public money in, in trying to leverage private investment into that sector. And, and we are where we are today in Europe because of, because of, largely because of that. So last week they took the decision, and it's a very important decision, to actually phase out investing into fossil fuels. So as of next year, two years' time, they will put all their... their, their uh, they will fund from the balance sheet uh, no more no more fossil fuel project projects. Everything will go into 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 climate action. You see the amount here that we hope to trigger. That is not enough. That's not enough. We think that for the European economy to actually make that shift, we need investments of annually 200 to 300 billion uh, euro. That's not enough. But it's the public sector can't do that alone. But um, 
that that's, that's our way of trying to trigger private investment. And then Blue Invest, and sort of that's our, that's my, my pet project, and that's, that's uh, what Michael mentioned in his, in his kind introduction. And it's basically a, 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 an attempt to try to help early stage companies in these areas, uh, energy, biotech, uh, sustainable, innovative agriculture, clean shipping, um, many of the things that, that cut across the maritime sectors like um, anti-corrosion, underwater robotics, acoustic communication, et cetera, et cetera, to, to, to get to the market. And the, the, what we note is that there are, there, are many good, there are many, many good companies. Many of them are spin-offs from, from academia and research and from our research programs, actually. Uh, some of them take off straight away, and you know, if you have a really good new biotech product, you don't need to worry about uh, funding. For others, it's more difficult. It is partly because the financial sector is a little bit reluctant to, to go into that, and there are a number of other idiosyncrasies in that sector that you know very well. There are elements of risks that you don't have everywhere. And so what we have done in, in working with again, our European Investment Bank in Luxembourg, is to set up a scheme that has, that has uh, three elements. One is business support. So we have a platform, a Blue Invest platform, uh, with a website, with a team of, of, of consultants that provide assistance. We have launched a grant scheme to help, so, like, like you do in the, in, the, in the US, actually, to help some of these, these these, these companies sort of get ready for, for you know, certification, testing, this kind of thing, market ready. And we are trying to make public money available to de-risk private investment through a, uh, an equity scheme. This is sort of a big experiment. It's, it's also not very large scale. We talk in terms of public investment around 150 million euro in total. So it's, it's a small thing. Um, I hope it will work. Uh, if it works, perhaps you know, we can do more in the coming years. And uh, if, you, if you would like um, to be part of that, um, that's one occasion. And uh, I discussed with Michael. And if Michael uh, has time and can make it, he would be very welcome to be there. But you would be very welcome to be there. That's our, our investment summit. We had one in 2017. We had one in 2018. 2018, one we did in the Mediterranean. We'll do it back in Brussels on the 4th of February. And, um, and this will be a bit. So learning from you guys, a pitching event um, and a matchmaking event. So both these, we try to bring in the companies and the investors. And we had a very good sort of feedback from our last event. But quite a number of deals were made. And, uh, and that's what we try to repeat. And uh, I, I think it's going to be very exciting to, to do that. OK. I could have shown you, you know, 50 more slides, but I'm going to stop here because uh, everything is red right on the screen. So thank you very much, and you know, really thanks again for having me here.